thank you all for coming. Thank you for inviting me to your office to, uh, to talk about it, the history of the office. Um, I, it's, very, it's very cool that you would, you would take time out of your lunch hour to, to, to see me. I feel like lunch is sacred. Um, so this is, this, I feel like I, this is very, very gratifying for me. So thank you, thank you for coming. Um, so my book is a, is a history of uh, the office, the, the, the workplace, not the show, and um, it's, it's uh, I've had, you don't know how many times I've had to say that. It's actually people, that I, when I, I'm like, yeah, I wrote this, I'm writing this book, it's a history of the office, and they're like, that sounds super boring. I mean, like, they just, they're like, why did you, why, you mean you just watched the show and you wrote about it? And then I have to explain, and then they're like, that sounds even more boring. <laughs> so why would you, why would you do that with your day? I mean, you don't even work, you know, I, I, I don't work in an office now, because uh, I, I write books, and, um, but, you know, why I would do that seemed to many people very masochistic, which maybe it is. Um, but I, I just want to talk today, I have, um, I, I will start by talking about the history of the office, where, where, where I sort of locate the origin of the office in the book. Um, and then uh, I want to, I'll talk about the, the, the most important part of the history of the office, which is when, when I uh, entered the office. That was a big day for work, um, was when they, it let me in. And because um, and people often ask me why I got interested in the topic, and, and of course I got interested because I had an office job, and then um, and I took it, I took my interest a little too far, um, <laughs> and and got obsessed. And then I want to kind of conclude with the uh, with the one, the thing that I that see, became the seed for the book in general, which is the history, the curious history of the office cubicle, which um, like everything I think is super fascinating. Um, it's, it's chiefly because it, it, and some of you may know this a little bit, that the, the original office cubicle was meant to liberate office workers and it turned into this kind of symbol of white collar servitude. And how that happened I think is paradigmatic for, for the general story of the way we work and, and what's going on now. And then, I don't know, I think we could talk, you know, there's some stuff towards the end of the book and then stuff I've written about, about the so-called future of the office which we could, which we could talk about or, you know, in a Q and A setting, um, so some of this is some of this is some material from the book. Some of it is fresh. Um, so, anyway, thank you for having me. This is uh, the from the origin of the office about clerical workers. Um, they labored in poorly lit, smoky single rooms, attached to merchants and lawyers to insurance concerns and banks. They had sharp penmanship and bad eyes, extravagant clothes but shrunken, unused bodies, backs cramped from poor posture, fingers calloused by constant writing. When they were not thin, angular, and sallow, they were ruddy and soft. Their paunches sagged onto their thighs. Clerks were once a rare subject in literature. Their lives were considered unworthy of comment, their workplaces hemmed in and small, their work indescribably dull. And yet one of the greatest of short stories is about a clerk, uh, Bartleby the Scrivener uh, by Herman Melville. Melville had become famous for writing memoirs and novels about spectacular sea voyages to exotic islands. Uh, he became famous, but he lost the readership eventually with this strange uh, long book about a whaling voyage. Um, he decided to turn inward after this. Weirdly, I mean, if you write all these books about whaling and stuff, it, it's odd that your next choice would be to write about the snug, uh, suffocating world of the office and to exchange the titanic hunt for the white whale to the hunt for the right size pen. And uh, he writes a lot about finding the right position to sit at a desk. This is from Bartleby the Scrivener. If for the sake of easing his back, he brought the table lid at a sharp angle well up towards his chin, and wrote there like a man using the steep roof of a Dutch house for his desk. Then he declared that it stopped the circulation in his arms. If now he lowered the table to his waistband and stooped over it in writing, then there was a sore aching in his back. So you see this is the, the story of the standing desk, but from 1853. Melville was really progressive when it came to office design. Um, Melville had worked for a few years as a scrivener on Wall Street, the setting of Bartleby, some years before he uh, took to the ship. 
He knew from inside, therefore, the peculiar emptiness of that office work could have, its atmosphere of what he thought was purposeless labor and dead-endedness. Even in Moby Dick, he speaks of the thousands of Manhattan who idle along the battery, lost in what he calls sea reverie. And they just are lost because they, and they want to avoid returning to their work lives, quote, pent up in lathe and plaster, tied to counters, nailed to benches, clinched to desks. Uh, in Bartleby the Scrivener, the few windows in the office look out onto nothing but more walls. On one end, the unnamed narrator writes, the window faced the white wall of the interior of a spacious skylight shaft, penetrating the building from top to bottom. And on the other side, there was an unobstructed view of a brick wall, black by age and everlasting shade. This wall, the narrator adds, Riley, quote, required no spyglass to bring out its lurking beauties, but for the benefit of all nearsighted spectators, was pushed within 10 feet of my window panes. On two sides then, two walls, the white wall of the light shaft, on the other, a soot black brick wall hemming in vision and light. It was a room with no view. Uh, what Bartleby means has been a subject of endless debate. There's, uh, you know, there was even a film a few years ago called Bartleby set in like a cubicle office, but it was just the same story. The office workers have sort of always taken it to be a mirror of, uh, I mean, of a bad office, of bad office work. And Bartleby's famous phrase, I would prefer not to, when, they, when his, his boss asks him to work, he just says, I would prefer not to. It's sort of an encapsulation of how the office has this way of reducing all titanic conflicts to petty grievances and simmering resentments. Um, the funny thing is that is in, in 1853, I mean, this story is so prophetic, uh, but when it was written, the term office itself and the sort of labor that was performed there had nowhere near the universal significance it has now. Um, in those tense years before the Civil War, clerks were just a small and unusual phenomenon, a subject of anxious scrutiny. Their workplaces were at once centers of American business and breeding grounds for a kind of work that nobody recognized as work. Clerks were a kind of worker that seemed like Bartleby at once harmless and ominous. Um, Bartleby, so then, was early evidence that the office had just begun to block blot its inky mark on the consciousness of the world. Um, people ask me often, because I just, it, maybe it's tragic, I've become an office expert. Uh, they ask me, where does the office begin? What's the first office? And this is actually a question without an easy answer. You can just start with the origins of paperwork itself, uh, which is until quite recently, the only, the most common association with office work is paper. Um, I, I still use it. Um, you can think of the derogatory phrase paper pusher, uh, which is increasingly becoming obsolete. Um, I don't know what, we should come up with a new phrase, right? I mean, code, you push code, is that right? But you like, well, what else? But that's not what I mean, anyway. We can work on this. Um, in other words, since the invention of writing and the corresponding ability to keep records in a systematic manner, there have always been places that resemble offices, monasteries, libraries, scholars' studies. Uh, banking has always furnished an especially large amount of paperwork. The Uffizi Gallery uh, in Florence uh, was also one of the first office buildings. The bookkeeping offices of the Medici family. Um, clerks have existed for ages. Many, often, many of them uh, became quite famous. There's the diarist Samuel Pepys, the British government diarist, who is a major source of knowledge about 17th century England. Alexander Hamilton uh, was a merchant's clerk before he became Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, Benjamin Franklin. Uh, paragon of pecuniary restraint and bourgeois self-abnegation. It's a dry goods clerk. Uh, some of the tediousness of his own writing may have been honed in the conditions of his first job. Uh, since clerks have had the opportunity to keep diaries, they've bemoaned the sheer boredom of their tasks, the endless copying, the awkward postures, the meaninglessness of their work. When not doing writing for their job, clerks have cultivated their habit of writing about the job or literally around it. Um, there's some infamous marginalia we have from medieval scribes. Uh, in one, on, you know, on the sides of manuscripts they were copying, they were so bored that they would just continue to write about how bored they were. Writing is excessive drudgery, one such jotting reads. It crooks your back, it dims your sight, it twists your stomach and your sides. And then one scribbling on one manuscript just goes, oh, by hand. Um, and that, which is dumb, because actually writing out that sentence is worse than your hand gets, you know. It just, anyway, it was, clerks were not super smart. Um, so, I mean, it's, it, you know, you could, all, you could say that this is, all, this is all office work, right? 
But I, I take a different tack. I think if you, to find the emergence in office in history, the workplace that really prefigures the offices of today, even if it doesn't look like, say, the office we're in right now, um, not superficially anyway, you have to look at a peculiar confluence of new sorts of buildings, deep economic changes, as well as, and this is the most slippery of all to pin down, uh, new kinds of feelings and mass awareness of one another in the workforce. Um, and this, I think, starts to happen, I locate this in the mid-19th century in America and England, but you, you see this elsewhere as well. At that time, industrialization in Britain and America was producing more and more administrative work, and alongside it, a need for a rational approach to managing accounts, bills, and ledgers, in short, paperwork. And rising to take these positions were clerks, who, and this is the key thing, they were looking around, they began to feel that they themselves were part of some new special group. It's like we, they, there was this sort of sense of we clerks, we, they didn't all say office workers, but we, we they knew that they belonged to something different. Um, and their kind of work was different. So one finds the office coinciding then with a change in the position of the clerks themselves. It's a new restiveness on their part, a new sense of power. They're not sure of themselves, but they're no longer isolated. By the middle of their 19th century, clerks in their workplaces begin to appear with a new regularity in literature and journalism. And so Bartleby, with its simultaneously assertive and retiring protagonist, I think nicely captures this ambivalence over the early world of the office. What, what Bartleby also captures, what makes it so great as a short story, is that at the time, people really thought office work was unnatural. At the time, the US, you know, shipping and farming, building and assembling, these were the natural order of work. And in this, clerks just didn't seem to fit. They, uh, it's odd because at the time, they were the, they were the fastest growing sector of the workforce in the late 19th century. In 1880, less than 5% of the workforce, about 186,000 people, was in the clerical profession. But in cities, they were the fastest growing. Uh, in some mercantile cities like New York, they had become ubiquitous. The 1855 census recorded clerks as the city's third largest occupational group, just behind servants and laborers. So there was, you, you, had, you had like manual workers and then office workers. And this was, uh, for many, a, a terrible development. Um, nothing about clerical labor was congenial to the way most Americans thought of work. Clerks didn't work the land, lay railroad tracks, make ammunitions in factories. Uh, let alone hide away in a cabin by a small pond to raise beans and live deep. Unlike farming or factory work, office work didn't produce anything. At best, it seemed to reproduce things. Clerks copied endlessly, bookkeepers added up numbers to create more numbers, and insurance men literally made more paper. Uh, for the tobacco farmer or miner, it was not work. Uh, he, the clerk, was, inevitable, was a kind of parasite to them on, others, on, on the work of others, and they literally did the heavy lifting. And so for the stereotype of, of workers was that they were sinewy, tanned by the relentless sun, or blackened by smokestacks soot. And the bodies of clerks were slim, almost feminine in their untested delicacy. Um, the press took a lot of time, a sh kind of shocking amount of time, to leveling invectives against clerks. Uh, this is from the what, a big journal at the time, the American Whig Review. We venture the assertion that there is not a more dependent or subservient set of men in this country than are the genteel dry goods clerks in this and other large cities. The American Phrenological Journal uh, had stronger advice for young men facing the prospect of a clerical career. They said, don't do it. Be men instead, therefore, and with true courage and manliness, dash into the wilderness with your ax and make an opening for the sunlight and for an independent home. Uh, Vanity Fair had the strongest language of all. They said clerks were, quote, vain, mean, selfish, greedy, sensual, and sly, talkative, and cowardly. And they spent all their minimal strength attempting to dress better than, quote, real men who did real work. Uh, it was somehow never questioned that um, journalism, which was also conducted in offices with pen and paper, constituted real work. Um, but that would have been <laughs> too complicated. Um, the attire of clerks was a barb for the, for the press. I mean, the very concept of business attire came into being around this time. There's a manual of etiquette from this time that writes, in the counting room in the office, gentlemen wear frock coats or sack coats. They need not be a very fine material and should not be of any garish pattern. Uh, there are other fashion advisors at the time who pointed to a host of business coats, uh, business surtouts, business pale tots, 
you could find at new stores. There was a store at the time uh, called Brooks Brothers, uh, which, which, was, which came up to, to, to clothe office workers. Um, you may know it. Uh, working class Americans were seen in straight straw hats or green blouses, but the clerk had a certain kind of collar. It was usually bleached in immaculate white and it was starched into imposing stiffness. Uh, but collar business shirts were actually quite expensive. Um, so even Brooks Brothers used to sell collars by themselves. You would buy, you would buy your white collar and put it on. Um, and half a dozen collars is about the cost of a shirt. And so this is kind of a key thing. The white collar was detachable and yet it was essential as a status marker. It was sort of the perfect symbol of what was, was pseudo-genteel, the dual nature of office work. And this clerk become a subject of satire and fiction. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe wrote a story called The Man of the Crowd, where he's observing this tribe of clerks, uh, and he, it is sort of composed entirely of overdressed dandies, imita imitating aristocratic styles several years old. This is from that story. There were the junior clerks of flash houses, young gentlemen with tight coats, bright boots, well-oiled hair, and supercilious lips. Setting aside a certain dapperness of carriage, which may be termed deskism, for want of a better word. The manner of these persons seemed to me an exact facsimile of what had been the perfect bon ton of about 12 or 18 months before. They wore the cast-off graces of the gentry, and this, I believe, involves the best definition of the class. The division of the upper clerks of staunch forms, or of the steady old fellows, it was not possible to mistake. These were known by their coats and pantaloons of black or brown, made to sit comfortably with cravats and waistcoats, broad, solid-looking shoes and thick hose and gaiters. They all had slightly bald heads, from which the right ears, long used to pen-holding, had an odd habit of standing off on end. I observed that they always removed or settled their hats with both hands and wore watches with short gold chains of a substantial and ancient pattern. There's the affectation of respectability, if indeed there be an affectation so honorable. Uh, this is quite nice. Uh, this is quite loving portrait of clerks, the satirical but loving. Um, Walt Whitman, the poet, uh, had, had different words. Um, he set out to establish that clerking was antithetical to American democracy. He wrote this piece called Broadway, and where he's observing clerks coming down Broadway in New York City. And uh, this is around the 1850s. Um, and, he, and he writes, a slender and round-shouldered generation of minute leg chalky face and hollow chest. What, they were trig, excuse me, they were trig and prim and great glow of shiny boots, clean shirts, sometimes now of an extraordinary pattern as if overrun with bugs, tight pantaloons, straps, which seem to be coming into fashion again, startling cravats, and hair all soaked and slick with sickening oils. What wretched, spindling, forked radishes would they be? And how ridiculously would their natty demeanor appear if suddenly they could all be stripped naked? So you didn't, you didn't like clerks. Um, and and, and you, uh, the funny thing is that just the, the sense of clerks as being weak, unmanly, they didn't, they, were, they just, they looked thin and like they, you know, they didn't, they didn't do heavy lifting unless they lifted boxes. Uh, this, this was perceived by clerks themselves and this, this sort of led to the culture of the modern gym at the time. You find a lot of clerks writing about going to the gym. They're like, we have to not be narrow-chested, like Whitman says we are. We, we, let's, I advise everyone to go to the gym. And it was, you know, it was so, in a way, that hasn't, uh, hasn't changed. Um, uh, this fantasy that Whitman had of stripping clerks naked, exposing the clerk to his own inadequacy, I think only concealed a deeper fear about the changing world of American business. Under the pressures of growing industrialization in the north of the United States, the Jeffersonian democracy of farmers was heading towards the same fate as the buffalo. More importantly, the old 18th century world of businessmen who were also craftsmen, white collar types who worked with their hands, began to suffer a slow decline as merchants and their groups of clerks started to exploit their superior knowledge of distant markets, and industries began to require more and more bookkeepers to maintain their ever more complicated accounts. Uh, the growth of manufacturing led to myriad urban retail and wholesale, est wholesale establishments, which uh, in turn required more clerks. The basis of prosperity, Hunt's Merchants Magazine held in 1839, lay in, quote, the vast modern increase of the facilities for diffusing and obtaining full and correct information on everything pertaining to trade. The people who handled this were clerks. 
cities began to acquire ever more sizable number of clerks, ambling down the broad avenues from men like Whitman to Gawk and Fredover. By 1860, 25% of Philadelphians were working in non-manual occupations. By the brand new city of San Francisco, it was already 36%. In Boston, it was 40. Not all of them were clerks, but the trend was clear. More and more people had ceased to work with their hands and were now working with their heads. The journals of opinion in the US might have hated the wretched, spindling office worker, but the hatred refracted the intense ambivalence over the nature of business, and that clerks might not be an aberration, uh, but the future. Um, so that's, that's sort of the, the, a little bit about the origin of the office. Now, like I said, I, I want to talk about the origin of me um, in the office, which is a great story. Um, I, I, ever since I began writing this book, uh, people have asked me where the idea came from, why given the many paths available to a person in the world, especially with a certain level of education and skills, would I choose to spend years of my life um, studying desks, uh, and chairs, and file cabinets, typing pools, accounting machines, demountable partitions, steel reinforced masonry, curtain walls, and of course, cubicles. Why, moreover, would I want to be reading esoteric treatises like the marketing plans for Herman Miller Furniture in 1962, uh, studies from journals of organizational psychology from 1920, the proceedings of the International Association of Office Managers from 1935? Why on earth would I want to spend serious time plumbing the hallucinatory treatises of erstwhile superstar business guru Tom Peters for insight into the mind and life of the American white collar worker? Uh, months after finishing the book, I really don't have an answer that satisfies me, but here, at the very least, is a provisional attempt at one. Um, the idea for a book in the office first came to me when I was working in an office. I got my first job straight out of college. Uh, this was lucky, uh, even in the, first, in the uh, comparatively flesh years of 2005, which the economically minded among you will remember as one of the peaks of the, quote, jobless recovery in the United States that followed the dot-com crash of the... Uh, late two, of 2000, 2001, 2002. Um, I was working in a large corporate publishing house, one of the biggest in the world with branches all over the place. It, um, it's named after a certain tuxedo colored species of Arctic animal. I, I just, I, I don't want to name pers names, so I'll just call it Polar Bear Books. Um, at Polar Bear Books, I was an editorial assistant in the business books imprint helping to acquire and edit scintillating treatises on brand management and endless attempts to one-up Clayton Christensen's book, The Innovator's Dilemma. Uh, please do not write any more books about The Innovator's Dilemma. There's just, I, I'm, there are so many. The Innovator's Problem, The Innovator's Solution. I mean, it's just, ugh. Anyway, um, so many. The work was nine to five, pretty much, um, and the hierarchies were very straightforward. The atmosphere pleasantly corporate, the office design as traditional as could be, the corridor offices around the side, cubicles in the middle. Uh, my cubicle was enormous and had tons of shelf space. I spent a shocking amount of company time pinning things to it. Uh, cartoons, poetry, color printouts from the office printer, which are very expensive for the office. Um, and then I was doing this when I wasn't wandering the office and gossiping to anyone I could find. Um, over time, I started to tire of ordering my boss's lunch, although it was the one thing I did really well, um, and some of the more mindless work I was tasked with. More damaging, I think, to my morale was the fact that every so often a friend I had made would disappear or be disappeared. It wasn't that they had left for another company. It was that they had been fired or laid off. No one would be told of their leaving. Suddenly, their items in their presence would be spirited away, and one would have to go at great, to great lengths to find out why, say, a longtime editor with a newborn child had been thrown out into one of the grimmer job markets in recent memory without so much as a word of explanation. Um, to many of you, this might seem naive on my part, but to me, an ingenue in the brutal world of American capitalism, it was something I found difficult to stomach. So I left. For another publishing house, it was a smaller place with a more academic list, uh, sort of a crossover list. Um, it was more interesting. I had more control over my work, but the pay, uh, the work was harder. My pay was $30,000 a year. Uh, and I, I, you shall gasp at this, at this fact. Um, in New York City, that's very, not, not a lot. Um, or anywhere. 
Uh, it's just horrible. The, it remained the same, but my hours got worse. The books to staff ratio was twice that of the previous company. My benefits were also worse. My healthcare costs increased. Uh, my boss made me work nights and come in on weekends, chiefly because I worked in publishing, and one only does that, she said, because you love it. One way of learning not to love it is to work day after day, after hour after hour without overtime. At the same time, the office arrangement became more precarious. The lighting in the central area was alternately poor or overbearing. Where my area was dark and obscure, one of my friends, a rather pale, blonde specimen of humanity, was under a poorly placed skylight, which meant that if he sat in place all day, as indeed he had to, he would burn. <laughs> he placed a piece of poster board on top of the cubicle walls as a kind of retractable roof. Um, like, uh, what, where did the Dallas Cowboys play? Yeah, it's like, you know, it was a kind of dome um, to keep himself from being scorched. My own cubicle was smaller than my before, and my back was to my boss's door, which had me constantly looking over my shoulder to make sure no one was watching. And then when she closed the door, I was even more freaked out. I mean, closed doors, there's nothing sort of scarier than, than sitting out in a cubicle and watching two people behind you just walk into a, a, an office and close the door, because you're just like, what? What are they talking about that they can't, that I can't hear? Um, so I said the workload was published, punishing, the job situation precarious. Uh, halfway through my time there, an entire department was laid off uh, just months after a few of them had been hired with the CEO saying that he was caving to a painful reality. I knew that something had to be done, but I had no way of understanding what that meant. I lazily tried to talk my coworkers into considering unionizing. But the thing about white collar offices in America is that the idea of a union hardly ever enters an office worker's mind. The office is both looks like and is structurally set up to be a meritocracy. You can rise from the cubicle to the corner office. At the same time, everyone knows that this isn't always true. There's personalities, there's petty politics, all sorts of unfair situations can intervene uh, to make the idea of merit a farce in some situations. At the same time, the idea of organizing to make the division between management and labor less arbitrary counters everything I think that we believe about office life. The fact that any clerical worker is, or you know, junior staff member, you, when you start at the bottom, you're a junior businessman in training, business person. This central contradiction of office life I think makes it at once a source for many people and inevitably for just as many people, a source of frustration, a source of hope as well as a source of frustration. So eventually I quit this place. I, I was sick of overwork and I discovered that I could make the same amount of money, uh, weirdly, as a temp in a job that sucked uh, less of my mental energy, um, my spirit, and my time. I got a job, uh, I was placed, really, working for a private equity firm on Park Avenue. This was the, you know, before the financial crisis, so flush years. Uh, not for temps, but, um, you know, I wasn't ta I was, uh, taking in commission. Um, but I was working in a cubicle suite shared by two other administrative ass assistants who gabbed all day. And I felt like I had been squeezed in. My cubicle, I'm sh I, I believe that it was two by two feet. I know that's physically impossible, but, um, but you know, it's, it certainly felt that way. I, just, I was like this the, the whole time. Um, but it was meant to encourage greater interaction, they said. Uh, my bosses liked me, but eventually they realized I wasn't doing much work there. So they moved me to a larger cubicle uh, right next to a very powerful air conditioner. In the midst of summer, I wrapped myself in wool sweaters and scarves while I muddled through PowerPoints about how to get more state pension funds to invest in private equity. Eventually, I was out of there too. And by that point, I was researching the history of the office as a freelancer. And then I started to realize a kind of irony in this. I realized I had gone through all the stages of being an office worker since the middle of the 20th century in about two years. I had started in a very cushy corporate firm in sort of like a 1950s place. I had moved to a more precarious and entrepreneurial spot where everything was on the verge of collapse or being bought out, sort of like the 1980s. And after a stint as a temporary worker in a rich firm of high equity investors performing skillful leverage buyouts of various public companies, I was on my own. My capacious cubicle that I had suddenly been squeezed out of, that I had been in, had suddenly been squeezed out of existence. Um, and it was at this point that I started researching the history of the office cubicle. Um, the, th the curious thing about the office cubicle is that, uh, and I'll just sort of talk about this and then we can break to Q&A. Um, 
is that I, the reason I, I, I sort of got so interested in the history of the office is that I, I just started researching. I was like, why do we work in cubicles? Why? And, and maybe you guys don't? What did, I, haven't, I haven't actually seen the office right now. Do you guys have cubes? I know, I know in Mountain View some people do, right? They, I've seen that. Um, and, you know, the, the cubicle is like, it's a symbol, right? It's like, oh, the cu like you, no word is more efficient than cubicle. You just say cubicle and then, and then just, you know, waves of horror can wash over people. It's like cubicle farms, cubicle infernos, cubicle warrens. Like, like you, there's, there's terms like six packs for like packs of cubicles. Maybe you guys know this stuff. And then you're prairie dogging, looking over the top of a cubicle to um, uh, Dilbert, office space, you know, the line in office space. Human beings were not meant to sit in cubicles staring at computer screens all day. Like, it's just like this, this it's one of the, the, the purest words in the English language for connoting dread and insecurity and anxiety. Um, but when I looked into the history, I sort of discovered that it was not at all meant to be the case. And the way that what had, was meant to be the cubicle had, had become some, had, the way that what was designed as the, an, uh, the origin of the cubicle had sort of become its antithesis, I think, is one of the paradigmatic stories of the office. And I'd like to tell it to you now. Um, it's it'll, it, it's, it's uh, exciting. Let me just check the time. Okay. Um, in 1964, the iconic uh, furniture design company, Herman Miller, unveiled a, a, an office plan unlike anything had ever, anyone had ever seen called Action Office. It was the brainchild of Robert Probst, who was among the first designers to argue that office work was mental work. He actually used the term knowledge work. This was one of the earliest uses of this term. Um, it had been coined by Peter Drucker in, in 1962. Um, anyway, he, he so, so Probst was one of the first to argue that office work was mental work and that mental effort was tied to environmental enhancement of one's physical capabilities. Rather than a furniture item or a collection of them, Action Office was a proposition for an altogether new kind of space. Most office designs were, at the time, were about keeping people in place. I think people are familiar with the images. Uh, if you've watched Mad Men, of course, but if you've also seen The Apartment, the great film from the 60s, um, or the crowd in an earlier film, or how to succeed in business without really trying, where you have rows of desks in a, in a steno pool, or an accounting pool, and then corridor offices around the side. And this, people don't know this, but this was really modeled on factories. This came out of, uh, in the early 20th century, people were like, what are offices? We should, mo I mean, I'm being silly, but, like they, but really they didn't know what to do with these administrative spaces, and the only model of workplace that they had was the factory. And so they assumed that, that the office was a kind of paperwork factory. It should be organized accordingly. People should clock in and out. You, sh you file into this place on an effectively on a paperwork assembly line. And only when you ach achieve a certain level of prestige do you get an office of your own. Um, so this was, you know, this was about, it was about status. It was about place. It was about prestige. Uh, Probst hated this. He thought offices should be about movement. He thought offices should be about it should be about con being conducive to whatever kind of work you had to do at the time. Advertisements for Action Office at the time shows workers in constant motion. Indeed, the human figures in the images often appear blurred, as if the photographer were unable to capture their lightning speed. I mean, you have to imagine what it was like in the 1960s. They just, it, Probst was like, he, he thought of office workers as kind of futurist soccer players. Like, they were just constantly in motion, in motion and they were doing knowledge work here and then standing up and doing knowledge work there and then sitting down and there was, it was just this like incredibly dynamic idea of what office life was. It was the result of an unusual collaboration. Probes had been thrown together with one of his near opposites, George Nelson, who uh, some of the, if you are interested in design, you would know the name. He's one of the great mid-century furniture designers, just designers in general. He grew to prominence by converting the ideas of modernism into effortlessly cool pieces of furniture. Probst was um, laconic, prophetic, intransigent. He exuded the tight-lipped silence of the American West. He was from Colorado. Nelson, on the contra by contrast, was a scotch-swilling bon vivant and raconteur. Um, I don't know, if, has people seen the show True Detective? This, the people were, someone told me that they're like, oh yeah, Nelson and Probst is kind of like Woody Harrelson and um, Matthew McConaughey. Does that sound right? That sounds... No, it's, it's, I don't know, I mean, it's such a bizarre comparison that someone even thought of it, anyway. Um, 
The items Nelson had designed for Action Office were beautiful. It was homey and utterly modern, nostalgic and forward thinking. His desk surfaces rested on cantilevered die cast aluminum legs. There was a standing desk where a chrome brace doubled as a footrest and, uh, and it, had a, it was a roll top standing desk. These are very beautiful objects if you ever had a chance to look them up. Um, a communication center with a telephone was acoustically insulated for phone calls. There were many idiosyncratic touches. Because Probst had convinced himself that work out of sight was work out of mind, there were no large desk drawers. Instead, there was a movable display surface from which items could be retrieved and replaced at ease. Um, the standing desk kept workers off their feet, but also on their feet, rather, but also allowed them to leave work out overnight, securely closed. And it was very colorful. It was green, bright blue, navy blue, black, and yellow. I mean, not you know, unlike the office furniture you find here. Um, but this was very strange in the 60s, and in a way it remained strange. Um, it, was, it was sort of like a magazine advertisement or the pop art of the time of Warhol and Lichtenstein. Action Office at the time was very 60s. It proclaimed its allegiance to the spirit of the age. It was rich, advanced, liberating. In this sense, the Action Office that Probst had conceived and Nelson designed might have been the furly, first truly modern idea to enter the office, the first in which the aesthetics of design and progressive ideas about human needs were truly united. When Action Office was unveiled before the press, the answer was resoundingly affirmative. Seeing these designs, wrote the writers of industrial design, one wonders why office workers have put up with their incompatible, unproductive, uncomfortable environment for so long. Meanwhile, the more popular Saturday Evening Post cried, office workers of America, beware. The Action Office is coming. We are in real danger of being unable to work at 100% efficiency. Despite the rapturous reviews, Action Office didn't sell. Office managers complained that the entire system was too expensive because the furniture was made of such quality material. And the space that Action Office created was too vaguely defined, its borders too porous. The product won a few awards in the industry, uh, within the furniture industry, but it otherwise saw little adoption in the workplace. Uh, Probst, um, you know, he, he had sort of run up against a classic problem of design. Office planners and architects tend to imagine that the setup of their own offices should be the way that everyone should work. They pretend that their subjective methods are objective imperial results and then they try to impose them on a workplace. Um, in a way, you see this all over the place with, with open office plans where people just, they don't always work in a certain way, but they're just imposed. Um, unfortunately, the copycat action offices were starting to have strange, unforeseen effects on other workplaces. Rather than making them more flexible, they in fact appeared to be making them more regimented. The Douglas Ball, a designer for the rival furniture company Hayworth, came up with many, one of the many knockoff designs for the Canadian company Sunar. Initially excited, he emerged from the completed space utterly depressed. I went to see the first installation of the Sunar system, a huge government project, he said. The panels were all 70 inches tall. So unless you were six foot three, you couldn't look over the top. It was awful. One of the worst installations I'd ever seen. We thought it was extremely flexible in the plan view, but we had never considered the vertical elevation. And it was too late to fix the problem. He had trapped people in giant fabric-wrapped walls when he had meant, like probes, to free them. It turned out that companies had no interest in creating autonomous environments for their human performers. Instead, they wanted to stuff as many people in as small a space for as cheaply as possible, as quickly as possible. By 1978, Probst was composing memos on repositioning his dine, design panicked over the obsession with, quote, easily defined and accountable cost savings. He wrote, meanwhile, other matters of more profound influence on the real productivity of organizations have slipped into the background, he worried. Action office had been meant for flexibility. Instead, a new rigidity set in, though it was wrapped disingenuously in humanistic fabric. Probe's memos seemed to have no effect. Soon the designs for Action Office in the Herman Miller brochures began to seem more box-like. They were selling what the companies wanted. In 1998, a journalist interviewed Robert Probst, then 77 years old, for Metropolis magazine. He defended the features that had made his design so popular, its austerity, its flexibility but he conceded what he hadn't been willing to understand then. The dark side of this is that not all organizations are intelligent and progressive, Probst said. Lots are run by crass people who can take the same kind of equipment and create hell holes. Probst noted that his design had proved irre irrepressibly popular. 40 million employees in America at the time worked in 42 different versions 
of the Action Office. But he failed to note that by that point, they were all known by the same name, the cubicle. Thank you. Take questions. Um, we don't have to talk about cubicles. There are lots of things to talk about. I think you got to talk. Uh, you might have to step to the mic. Sorry. So it seems like there's a balance between what's good for the employee and what's good for the company in terms of you know productivity, however you want to describe it. So in terms, you, you talked a little bit earlier about the future of where this is all going. So I'd be curious, I mean, given the fact that companies are specifically here to make as much money as possible or improve uh, products, make the world a better place, um, what would you say the future looks like? I mean, what, where, how do you define the balance between what's good for the employee and what's good for the company? Um, it's, a very, it's a hard question, and, and predictions are always sort of uh, uh, wrong. You know, they, I mean, predictions are often wrong, as, you, as, as everyone knows. I, 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 now that I've seen lots of attempts to define the future of the office in the last 150 years. They, it's it's shocking how often people are right, but but and and also how how much they're wrong. The th the question though about in worker satisfaction, about worker sort of control over over what it is they do, and you know vis-a-vis -vis the the, comp the organization they work for, and you know what organizations think is is valuable, is definitely changing a lot. I think um, I I think it's. You know, I think one thing that we should, that just to take one part of that, I think one way to look at the future of the office is to look at the increasing inf informalization, I guess you would call it, casualization of the workforce. There are many, many more people at, at, at the present working at, in contract positions as independent workers, as freelancers, as temps, uh, than there have been probably since the 19th century. There's, those terms didn't exist, but it's something similar. Um, it's hard to estimate, but it's somewhere between 25 and 30 percent. Some people think this is the fastest growing sector of the workforce. And a lot of this is, un, is not conscious decision making on, on those workers' part. A lot of people are thrown out into, into independent work. You can't get, you know, people I know cannot get permanent employment. Um, or, but a lot of it, in a way, is a certain kind of disaffection, I think, with, with uh, companies that have, they feel, I think, shirked a certain obligation, a certain contract. Um, it may not feel that way at Google, and I don't really want to speak since I don't work here, you know, I don't, but, um, but, uh, but in many places you just, you, you find that, and I think this happened over the 80s and 90s, you know, one of the things I don't talk about in that little cubicle section is that the, the sort of sense of the cubicle as being this bad place really took off in the 90s when I think layoffs were more common, permanent employment became much less common. You know, in the 50s, you got a job and you kind of thought you would stay there. Um, and then you didn't. And so then it became, the cubicle became the sign of this callous workplace environment. It's like, oh, this company doesn't care. They just stuffed me in a, in a cubicle and I'm pro they're probably gonna leave me off, you know? Um, so I think, the sort of, the, the, what I think, when you want to look at the future of the workplace, I think you, you see, if you look at freelancing, if you look at temping, if you look at that sort of activity, if you look at people even just wanting to work from home more, um, people seeking certain kinds of flexibility in their work lives, I think you see a real desire for autonomy when it comes to determining, it may even be little things, like just how your work day goes, how, how you do your work, at where you do it. Um, or it may even be just controlling your work entirely outside the confines of, of a corporate environment. Um, and so that's where, you know, I think for me, I, I tend to load, when it comes to the balance, I tend to load things uh, on, on what's good for the workers, good for the company, rather than you know, the office space thing, like, is, it, is this good for the company? Um, I think, I think I, the workplaces I visited that seem to exude more sort of control by their employees over what they do uh, tend to be 
that tends to be the most tangible thing. And control can take many different forms. Um, I think you know, in, in workplaces like, like, like the ones in Silicon Valley, I think one of the things that you see is the reason a lot of these places are so, put so much, a lot of them put a lot of care into, which is un, you know, unusual. Um, and that also, in a way, res reflects a certain kind of mobility for the people who work in these places, that they can move, you have to sort of retain them. There's a way in, like a tighter labor market or a way in which workers seem to feel that they have a little bit more control over their choice, yeah. Uh, that means you might, you might, you're not, you're not actually, you may not even be making demands in a certain way over how the, but it's, but it's, it's, there's an unspoken latent idea of how the workplace should be. Um, and, and that I would hope would be the case in throughout, throughout I mean, that's, that's a better situation than a lot of people have. So that's, so I, I that's sort of a long answer because it's a big question, but yeah, yeah. You alluded to briefly the open office or open floor plan um, in kind of your, your opening. Uh, yeah. I was wondering if you had any thoughts one way or the other about how it um, relates to what you're describing in terms of, I guess, answering the last question or, or just the cubicle life in general you were describing earlier. Absolutely. Um, open office plans, I don't have, they're, they're uh, do you pe people know, I'm gonna steal a joke from something, do you know, um, People know the blog or the that book stuff white people like. Um, the, the it's it's uh, you know it's a list of things. If you don't know it, um, it's just a list of things like who what it's like like uh, I think I can't even come up with a good example now. But like ca cafe lattes, white people like cafe. You know like why like it's just a, it's a way of classifying a certain kind of upper middle class white taste, right? Um, and one of them. One of the things they list in stuff white people like is open office plans. Um, and, and the joke is that you, you grow up in America and you have this inexplicable loathing for the cubicle. You just hate it, you, even before you've worked in one. And so, and so the first thing you want is to work in an open office plan. And so there's this, he's like, like doing data entry or, or pushing code in a cubicle is somehow mindless drudgery but doing the same thing in an open office space with exposed brick walls is somehow creative and explosive. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but like, there's this, the thing about the open office plan is it's, is it, I, 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 I sort of understand the, the rhetoric behind it, that it's, it's meant to encourage collaboration, it's meant to encourage uh, just, it creates a certain kind of symbolic notion of openness, transparency, if people are familiar with the Bloomberg offices in, in, in New York City, which is a uh, big, like just, it's like each desk is like five by five, it's sort of, and they're slightly partitioned, and you're just crammed together. It's open, and it's huge floor plate, you just see across, it's like, it's, it's noisy, it's buzzy. Um, but these are like very, these are often very pretty spaces that have little basis in psychological research, how people actually work, what they should actually do. Um, I think the, the sort of rush to do it is, is, a, is a big mistake, frankly. Like, I just think there are, there are ways in which the, the offices that include openness as part of their workspace, the ones that are better have, like, you, you have to be able to retreat to do private space, to take a phone call just to, like, get away from noise. The, the fact is, like, they're very distracting. They often repeat the mistakes in cubicle environments because you can hear noise. And added to that is visual distraction. You just get up from your, you just, you just are constantly surrounded by visual distractions. And, the, and distraction has always been a problem in office environments. There's just very rarely room for private work or concentrated work. And that's most work. I mean, it's not, you know, it differs by sector, et cetera, but most work you actually have to just put your head down and concentrate. Um, so, the, there's a way in which the open office plan is, is repeating a certain kind of mistake that we made with the office cubicle. There's also, I mean, I should have mentioned this just briefly, the open office plan is, is not new, you know, I mean, the, the kind of rage for it now is new, but in the 1950s is when the first open office plan was invented, and it was invented in Germany um, by two designers working for the, the publishing company Bertelsmann. Uh, and it was called an office landscape, or bureau, bureau landschaft. Um, 
And it was, it was exactly like the op open office plans today. It's swirling patterns of desks, no hierarchies. Everyone had the same kind of like location. It was egalitarian in, in terms of design. And um, workers in, it was really popular among architects and designers, but workers in Europe actually rejected open office plans because they, were, they had sort of councils, union-like structures, the traditions of social democracy, and they were like, no way. We hate these places. We can't do any work, they're noisy. Egalitarian or not, like if you're a CEO in an open office plan, you're still a CEO. I mean, like it doesn't, that doesn't change your, I understand it makes you more approachable, but you know, it's not that. So they moved radically away from the way the US was trending and towards private offices. And, and it, it, it doesn't, you know, studies are equivocal, but they don't always, they show that they don't, you can still collaborate in private spaces. You can still do a lot of things that you need to do. And in some ways it's easier because you can, you can if everyone has a private space, that's egalitarian too. So uh, I guess I'm not hiding the fact that I'm really against open office plans. I just, I find that, I find that the, the, certainly the claims advanced on their behalf are totally exaggerated. And certainly if you want to include that kind of space, you have to make huge provisions for, for private space, and in a way they're imposed on people regardless of what they actually have to do. Yeah, who is first? Well, uh, the, oh, well, the, uh, your comment at the beginning kind of implied that you recognize that this book and this topic does suffer from uh, a lack of upfront sexiness, as, <laughs> as it were, which creates an interesting marketing uh, problem for, for the book. Um, and I'm just kind of, I, I mean, I know for myself that I was, uh, uh, there, there's a Hebrew saying, I was kind of like favorably disappointed. I, I said, okay, whatever, but I, this was hugely enjoyable, very, very interesting, very enlightening about, you know, in, in many ways. Uh, but you can see that there was, I mean, it's not exactly people are, you know, hanging by the door because he can't get in. Um, so, <laughs> what do you say? I'm sorry? <laughs> so I'm, I'm just kind of wondering what, what your th thoughts are about this. Or, or you just think the way it is, you wrote your book, and whoever comes, comes. And I mean, uh. Oh. Um, well, I, you know, I have to say I've been actually pleasantly uh, surprised by, by some of the, by the response. Um, uh, I think. I mean, even though people are not hanging off the rafters and throwing their bras at me, um, it's just, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's been, um, or underwear. I mean, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to make that gendered. It was, but it, <laughs> it, 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 um, it has, there has been, you know, I, the, the point of this, I think, was that office work is so common a part of, our, of so many people's lives. I mean, and, and especially in, in, in the West and increasingly in other countries as well. And I, as a worker, wanted to make this meaningful for myself. In a way, I wrote this book for people like me. And, 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 and in a sense that, you know, I know offices are different, industries are different, workplaces are different. Um, but there's also a show called The Office, which speaks to a certain kind of collective experience that is, however varied, is nonetheless common. And I think, um, I think that, was the, that was the sort of person I was writing for, and in a way I have, I feel like I, in speaking to people about the book when I was writing it and, and since, what it always elicits is someone trying to tell me about their office. They're like, oh, let me tell you about my office. Or like, you know, there's a way in which I think, um, I think there has been, you know, I, I've been surprised by the, by the interest. Some reviews been okay. You know, like, it's like, you know, and, and a lot of, and some of them even say like, I thought this book would be boring, and, uh, and it's not boring. You know, like I—I I mean, you, if, if I don't—I leave that to you, of course, to decide. If you—if you—you you may find it totally. Uh, judging by the talk, yeah. Yeah. and and I guess you do make a good point that you know, even, even if one in a thousand office worker, one in a hundred office workers, you know, thinks it is interesting, wants to know more. I mean, that's already a nice niche uh, chunk. You know, if there's, if there's some market there. Yeah, yeah, I, I I hope so. But yeah, it's the idea is that it's it's a central part of my uh, my life, our lives. So. Thank you. Yeah. So I was curious if the book treats at all uh, the topic of the extension of the office into the home, you know, mm -hmm. the, uh, the home office and basically the cubi cubi cubicalization of the home environment. You know, you think of loft 
living and uh, in live work environments and mm. I, I don't know if there are historical precedents for that that you know extend past the or you know beyond into the 19th 18th centuries um, but it seems like it's with with virtualization with telecommuting it's it's more the case now than ever that people are setting up offices within their own homes and I'm wondering if they they are taking office metaphors that you would find in a more collective environment and transposing them to the home or whether they're coming up with new ways of interacting all together. Yeah, it's a very, uh, yes, I mean, it, the short answer is yes, that I, I did treat it. It's, it's, um, it's a very difficult topic to talk about in a way because it, in a way it's so, it's so in, talked about and actually when I was finishing the book, the, the, uh, the kerfuffle over ya the Yahoo CEOs, Marissa Mayers, I'm sure this was a topic of discussion, you know, sort of eliminating telecommuting came up. Um, there, there, is, there is a sort of history of it. Um, it there, you know, people started foreseeing telecommuting as a, as, a, as a real thing in the 1970s. I think Business Week had ran a series about this in 1975 called The Office of the Future. Um, if you guys are familiar with uh, the, the futurologist Alvin Toffler, he's like this, he used to be this old yeah famous dude, uh, anyway, that I've sold millions of, I think it's in his book, The Third Wave, that might be wrong, but it's from 19, early 1980s. He foresaw that telecommuting would, um, the increased use of telecommuting would depopulate downtowns, that everyone would suddenly be working in these networked electronic cottages, he called them, out in the countryside. Um, and you would, you know, you would just be, you, you would just, there would be no more cities. Why would you have them? You wouldn't have neat skyscrapers. You would just have people working at home. Um, the curious thing is, and, th and this is sort of my interest in it, and the thing I, the thing I can, the way I sort of connect it is, and is that this hasn't happened. In a way, though, the office has bled out and, and out of the building envelope and taken, you know, set up, being set up in homes and into all areas of life, it has somehow created a need for more concentration um, what you see is actually people working in city-like environments or increasing the dent, or like really wanting density in a certain way. And the city sort of informally right now, but I think there are planned efforts at this, like Tony Shea in, in Las Vegas, to actually set up cities that support work anywhere. So it's not just, you know, a way the, the issue is not, not just homes, although that's interesting in terms of er the erosion between leisure mm -hmm. and work that is already quite advanced, but also obviously cafes, um, the rise of co-working facilities, which is largely to support freelancers, but it also supports, it could support, I'm sure any of you, you know, and, and if you needed to work at whatever it is, like next space or something. So the, in a way, the real context, to, I think, to consider that that kind of expansion of work is, is the urban environment. That like cities are in some ways are, plan are like, are turning into large, workspaces where everything where universities are talking about giving up more space to to people to work in them I think that's 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 where I see the trend and in a way um, it, it it points to a kind of new raison d'etre for for cities themselves is to is to function as like these expanded workplaces well it's funny because at the same time you've got say in San Francisco you know, you've got a lot of class and political conflict at the moment right right now about, about San Francisco being a feeder city into basically corporate office parks, you know, the, the law, the, the great corporate office park of Silicon Valley overall. Um, yeah. and, and a lot of people have answered, well, one of the solutions to that is greater telecommuting, right? I mean, you could, um, if, if you can't densify within, when, within a given city and the city is just going to become a feeder city, well, right. you could allow people to work from their homes. So there's this tension between sort of, I guess the terror of one's home becoming the, the office and also the utopian aspect of that at the same time, and it's, it's hard to know exactly where that will, will pan out. So. Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a very complicated question. I think the, you know, it, there, I mean, one of the, some of the people uh, with, in that particular situation, I think some of the proposals involve, you know, densifying the actual, like, offices, like the campus offices, in a way, they, they suck, they can, one of the critiques is that they suck economic activity out of the, the surrounding environment is that, you know, cafes, having a cafe in Facebook or Google means that you don't have it. 
you know, or, or it's less likely that you would have it for those workers outside, and or and you know, and then and then for anyone else. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, and the other thing that yeah, like you said, there is this. There are more people moving into San Francisco and commuting by bus or what have you to to um, to the offices down south. I mean, that's it's a more complicated issue than people are simply moving into that city. The city actually supports those activities and and doesn't support public housing. It doesn't support ways to keep people in San Francisco. It's just not, it's, you know, there's a way in which it doesn't provide economic activity that, that is varied or diverse. And that's been true of San Francisco for the last 30 years. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's um, I, I'm not saying that this, this class conflict isn't real and, and, and important. No, it has intense. a long-standing yeah. generational but, history, yeah. But yeah, but the, but the reason is not just, it's, just, it's accelerated tremendously in the last few years. And the reasons for that are, are not just people moving in. Thanks.